Who decides what we do when we worship? This is what we're going to talk about for a few minutes this morning. So we've talked about, what are, what are the elements of gathered worship that we've talked about so far? We name them. We've got to be able to remember this morning's, right? What's this morning's? Instructing. What else have we talked about? Giving. Praying. The backbone is reading. And then we also talked about opening and closing. And we're going to talk about singing later in the fall. Next Sunday is baptism and Lord's Supper. So, where does that list of elements come from? Who decides what we do when we worship? Should we have a ceremony to carry the Bible in and up to the pulpit, like we talked about a few weeks ago? Should we use candles, burn incense? Should we recite one of the historic creeds or doctrinal confessions of the faith altogether? Should we have political announcements or sing patriotic songs? Should we show movie clips in our sermons? Should we have drama, like acting, to help illustrate our sermons? Should we have live art on stage? Should we read from a prayer book up here, or should we have the congregation recite from a prayer book? Should we include prayers of confession, as we talked about a few weeks ago? Or should the leader offer forgiveness, express forgiveness? Should we sing only psalms or other types of songs? Should we <coughs> preach one long sermon or have multiple shorter explanations of Scripture readings? Should we have musical instruments? Or just sing a cappella? Should we have a band and set up a room like a concert? Should we have a choir? And the question I'm asking today is, who decides? And of course, ultimately, it's not who, it's where would the answer come from, but who decides? See, every church has a liturgy. The word liturgy just refers to the way you serve the people. It's the structure of a service. And every church has liturgy. Now, we use the word liturgical sometimes to describe churches where their liturgy comes from some sort of book or liturgical plan that they follow and is very, very structured. But every church has liturgy. Every church has a structure. Uh, like if a church, if a church has a, a band and a praise team, and they start with a wor worship set, and then they go into a sermon, and then they're done. That is a liturgy. They're going to do something very similar to that week after week. So once again, who decides? Where does a church's liturgy come from? How do we decide what is necessary and appropriate when the whole church gathers? So let's, let's just hit some biblical starting points first, because we're Grace Bible Church, and obviously we're going to say the answer is the Bible. But let's work out what that means a little bit. So number one, we know that Scripture is sufficient to guide us. We saw 2 Timothy 3 this morning. With the Scriptures in hand, the man of God is equipped for every good work. And in context of that letter, Paul is teaching Timothy about how to lead the church. So Scripture is sufficient to guide us in determining the elements of gathered worship. That doesn't mean that the Bible will answer every question and give us every detail. But it will give us the principles and the wisdom we need to make these decisions. So first, Scripture is sufficient. Secondly, if we go back to how the Old Testament might help us, the Old Testament is clear that worship must be done God's way. Will you take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 20? 
Exodus 20, verse 3 says, you shall have no other gods before me. And verse 4 says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall have no other gods before me, and then don't make for yourself any carved images, representations of earthly things. When you first read verse 4, it's not entirely clear whether he's saying, don't carve an image of another god, or whether he's saying, don't carve for yourself an image and then use it to worship Yahweh, the one true God. It's not perfectly clear from verse 4 by itself. Though, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me, sure sounds like it's forbidding idolatry. So that kind of gives us a, a, a hint about what what it means. But it's some other passages that really explain to us what is going on here. Like Deuteronomy chapter 4 is expanding on the second commandment. And in Deuteronomy 4, Moses says to them, you didn't see any form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, at, at Mount Sinai. God didn't reveal himself in a form but by speaking. So if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 12, Deuteronomy 12 verse 2, you shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. Now, if you pause right there, you'd say, okay, well, that's because we shouldn't worship any of those gods, right? Which is true the first commandment. But look at the next verse, verse 4, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Well, see that? So it's not just don't worship those gods, but it's also don't take those ways of worshiping the way that uses high places and, and uh, out in the woods in these clearings and carvings to worship. Don't worship your God in that way. Only worship him in the ways that he has defined. Over on Isaiah 40, I'm just putting it in my own words, but God essentially says, what carving could you possibly make that would reflect my glory? You couldn't. And so the first commandment outlaws worshiping other gods, but the second commandment is particularly about worshiping the true God as he should be worshiped. In particular, they're not trying to make images of him. So that begins to show us that God has to be worshipped his way, not just any way we want to. Someone could sincerely say, I just, I want to make a statue of God to worship. And it doesn't matter how sincere they are. You, you can't. It would not be worship that honors God. Not long after that, Exodus 20, we get to Exodus 32, and Israel makes this golden calf. And Aaron tries to present it as we're worshiping Yahweh with this golden calf. And the nation is almost destroyed because of that. Over in Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire upon the altar. And it's not exactly clear what the strange fire was, but it, it probably means either they, they got coals from a place they weren't supposed to get them from, or they used an incense mixture different from what God had defined. But regardless, fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. Though they were in this act of worshiping Yahweh, but they were doing it in ways that were clearly in violation of what God himself had said for 
his, his worship. And there are several other stories from the Old Testament that are similar. You've got Uzzah touching the Ark of the Covenant. You've got Gideon making an ephod to seek God's will, which sounds good, but then they start worshiping the ephod. Um, you've got Jeroboam who sets up a different place of worship and a, to, to when Israel and Judah uh, split. All those stories illustrate the principle that we can't just worship any way we want as long as we're sincere about it. We, we have to worship God's way. And then number three, the Old Testament gives extensive details about Old Covenant worship. Significant portions of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are, give details about Old Covenant worship. And through those details, we learn about God, we learn about His character, but those details aren't binding upon New Covenant believers for our worship today. So we don't determine the details of our worship based on the details of Old Covenant worship. Um, but we do use those things to learn principles about who God is and how He is worshiped. So what's the most important for us as New Covenant believers is the New Testament. Number four, the New Testament is clear about the essentials, but includes very few details. See, there's I would say there's really very little doubt when you read the New Testament about what the essentials of gather worship are. And there are also very few details about exactly how those things should be done. Clarity on the essentials, and then a lot of flexibility in the application to each particular church. And I'll talk about examples of that, about that maybe a little bit later. Okay? So, that's if we want to get answers from the Bible, that gives us a real quick overview of how we might find answers scripturally. But I want to just mention now, and when I talk about the kind of the history of this, I am being extremely general today um, and probably overly simplifying some of this, but hopefully it will, it will illustrate the main ideas. So historically, we might say, at, at least since the Reformation, that churches have taken one of three approaches. And again, this is way oversimplified, but um, I think this is on your handout, and we'll put it up here on the screen. So number one, churches should only worship in ways that the Bible approves. Only worship in ways that the Bible approves, and that is sometimes called the regulative principle. Number two, churches can worship in any ways that are wise as long as the Bible does not forbid them. You see the difference between number one and number two? Only the things that the Bible directly approves or anything that's wise as long as the Bible doesn't forbid it. Number three, churches can worship in any ways that bring people in and result in salvation decisions, which Bob Coughlin calls the whatever principle. Not that he's supporting that. It's just his wording. The whatever principle. Wait, go back a slide. Thanks. Now, obviously, number three is not right. The whole idea of using worship to bring people in and get salvation decisions misunderstands worship and who gathers for worship. That doesn't mean we don't pray for people to be saved here when we gather, but it is not our purpose in how we choose the elements of worship. So we know we can discard number three. But one and two are very interesting. Should we only worship in ways that the Bible directly approves? Um, or is it okay to worship in other ways as long as they're wise and appropriate and the Bible doesn't, doesn't forbid them? And that's a, been a, a point of some uh, controversy in, in the church. And I think from, just from our perspective, our church, who we are, I, I think there's something here that I'm going to call a historical plot twist. And here's what I mean. When you look at number one and number two, I think we would expect that number one, the regulative principle, this is kind of a, kind of a stricter view, right? We would expect that number one, where would you find churches who do that? And I think we would expect that you would find that in very heavily liturgical churches, where, where it's very formal very structured, and we would say that's probably the churches that are following number one. You know, they're using a book or a manual. Maybe it's historical or maybe it's from the denomination for that quarter or whatever, and now we're going to follow this plan right, right through. 
It seems very kind of strictly structured, and so that must be number one. But actually, so, so, so then we would think, well, then probably a church like ours, since we're not a church like that, we probably fit under number two. Worship in any ways that are wise as long as the Bible doesn't forbid them. And then, you know, it's the really seeker-driven megachurches and stuff that are in number three. But actually, historically, at least in the last, if we're talking about from the Reformation till now, number one was a response to heavily traditional, heavily structured liturgical worship. It was actually a response to that. The desire behind number one was to regulate worship according to the Word of God rather than do all of these accumulated traditions and, and this is a huge point, and the laws of the government. Number one was a response to a heavily structured worship service that was oftentimes laid down by the state church who said, you must follow this. You must do it just like this. And so number one was saying, we want to be able to worship according to the word of God rather than what the queen says we have to do. And at least for me, that's a little bit of a, oh, that's not quite what I expected here. So, the regular principle oftentimes was a response to things like predetermined prayers read from a book, predetermined sermons, which were often read from a book, predetermined scripture readings, which were, in some settings, a few key texts, a few verses brought together, which is great, kind of correlating scripture, but it was the same little set of verses that was then rotated to so that 99% of the Bible was never read, just those same sets of verses. The regulative principle was sometimes a response to reciting creeds, a priest who pronounced forgiveness upon the worshipers, prayers to the saints, murals or statues of the saints, a crucifix in the front of the church with Christ on it, a, a screen separating the congregation from the priests and the, and the altar, and so forth. And my point is not to say that every one of those things was wrong, though some of them were. Some of those things were appropriate. My point is just to help us picture a very heavily structured service and setting that seems to reflect a lot of accumulated and, frankly, calcified traditions. And then remember again that in some places, like, for example, 17th century England, those worship details were regulated by the state church. That liturgy was the law of the land. And so, number one, the regular principle was not really from a desire to be more strict in worship, in a sense. It was from a desire to be more biblical in worship to allow churches to regulate worship by the Word of God. And so, again, I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but many churches that followed, ended up following the regulative principle were known as free churches. Not because they could do whatever they wanted, but because they were free to regulate worship according to the Word of God rather than the dictates of a liturgy book and traditions handed down by the state church. So, to use a specific example of the Puritans in the Church of England, they wanted to be free to read whole chapters of Scripture as their Scripture readings, rather than the predetermined little piecemeal putting together of Scriptures that the state was requiring them to use. They wanted to be free for their pastors to study the Bible and preach the Word rather than reading a pre-written homily to the church. They wanted to be free to have the congregation sing rather than having a choir lead the congregation with these preset songs that they did time after time. So the regulative principle was historically a backlash against heavily predetermined, heavily liturgical worship defined by the state government. It was a desire. Yes, Scott. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm going to get there. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, that's like the next thing I was going to say, so you were right on time. Along the way, free churches sometimes fell off the rails in a couple different directions. And again, I'm oversimplifying, but one of the ways they fell off the rails was what Scott's referring to. That is, throw out every tradition. <laughs> throw out everything historical. We are going to completely reinvent worship according to God's word, and anything that anybody did before us is bad and we ought to get rid of. Um, and that connects to iconoclasm and other things that were sometimes problems in the Reformation. And sometimes that got really crazy. For example, no musical instruments. There were a number of churches that, in the name of the regulative principle, outlawed, outlawed musical instruments. And they said it was unbiblical to have anything other than that. Some churches outlawed anything other than psalm singing. No other songs except the direct words of, of the psalms. And of course, um, in more modern times, there have been, you know, churches that, I don't know, somehow they think they're reinventing the worship wheel. There's been a third wave of the Spirit, and this is worship like it's never been done before, and so we can ditch everything. And you guys know that is not what GBC does. Like, three Sundays ago, when, the, when we finished our singing together, I, I came up and said, isn't it cool that we just sang two songs from the 1700s and, and a song from 2015 and a song from 2018? Um, this Christianity thing is not new. <laughs> uh, we're just part of a long stream of the people of God. So there is that rail that some free churches fell off of. And then on the other end of the spectrum, some free churches took the freedom thing and they ran with it. And they decided it's the whatever principle. We can do whatever we want in worship. And very often that was, we'll do whatever we want in worship if people get saved. That's like the one measurement that you use to determine whether it's right or not. If it works, if it gets a big crowd, if people make professions of following Jesus, then we'll do that and, and call it worship. So in both of those, pure, that's just pure pragmatism. And that has nothing to do with what free meant uh, historically. Free meant free to regulate worship by the Word of God rather than by the state government or even a manual or something else. Okay, any other questions about that before we move on to the how do we determine what we do? Not that I'm going to know all the answers, but Dr. Talbert's here, so it'll all be good. They're being nice to you, I guess. All right, so how should we determine the elements of biblical gathered worship? Number one, and this is going to, again, relate to what Scott was saying. So we're on the back page now. Number one, seek to understand and think biblically about the historical traditions of our particular church. Not to throw out those traditions. And frankly, within biblical Christianity, we'd be better to start with the assumption that our forefathers knew what they were doing than the assumption that they didn't and I do. That just violates what the Bible says about elders and about parents and so forth. So we would be better to start with the assumption that if the generations of Christians before me did certain things, they probably had good Bible reasons for it. Now, that might not always be the case because as you all know, as parents, we want our children to go beyond us. We want them to mature beyond us. We want them to see things more clearly than we saw those things. And so, frankly, the Christians before us would want us to go beyond them. If there were weaknesses, if there were blind spots, they would want us to see those, not keep reproducing the same problems. But we don't start from the assumption that those old people are dumb and us cool new people know everything. Instead, we say, why have we why, why did they do things in these ways? What were the biblical reasons why they did the things in those ways? And then that allows us to examine those traditions biblically, because some of those traditions are not biblically healthy. Does that make sense? And by the way, which, which churches 
don't have tradition that plays into how they worship today? The answer is nobody. Nobody. However a church worships, there are always reasons. There are always influences. There are always, where did you go to school? What did you see in worship growing up? There are always influences. Everybody's influenced by tradition. It, it might be, it just might be 50 years old tradition, or it might be, you know, 1,500 year old uh, tradition. Every church's worship is connected back to traditions. Interesting that here in Southern California, the most common worship structure is a band, a praise team, a worship set, and then a sermon. And that too is rooted in traditions. It's rooted in traditions that go back to the 70s and 80s, but it's also rooted in traditions that go back to frontier worship and revivalism in the 1800s. And it's actually rooted in traditions that go back to free church traditions from the Reformation. So no church reinvents worship on its own without some historical context. So what every church wants to do is understand, wait, what, what did we receive? What did we experience? What did we see? How were we trained? Because that's, that's what we naturally bring in. Crystal and I still, to this day, laugh about the fact, and this isn't about gathered worship, but we laugh about the fact that we started Grace Bible Church in October, the end of October in 2003. We had a Christmas program in December of 2003, and we had a Valentine's banquet in February of 2004. Now, there's nothing wrong with a Christmas program or Valentine's banquet, but whether they were the wisest thing for our brand new tiny little church plant is a different question. But why did we do them? My grandma could put on one amazing Valentine's banquet. She was a poet. She was a ham. She loved the Lord. And so I grew up with church Valentine's banquets every year. And they were fun, and the couples loved them. And, and uh, so what do we do? We did a Valentine's banquet in 2004. And the next Valentine's banquet we did was in 2022. And Pastor John did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Correct. Yes. I'm sorry, don't trust my memory about anything. 2016, we had a Valentine's banquet and my parents spoke. You're right. And maybe there's another one I've forgotten. I apologize. The point is, we didn't do them in 2005, 6, 7, 8. <laughs> For sure. Um, so we want to be very aware of what worship traditions have, have influenced our church, not to throw them out, but to look at them biblically and examine whether they're healthy and biblical whether we should keep them. Number two, so that's number one. Number two, get the musts from the Bible. The essentials of worship have to come straight from the Bible, not from our ideas about worship, but from God. We should not trust human ingenuity to determine the main things in worship because left to our own ingenuity, we tend toward idolatry instead of worship. We shouldn't trust our worship feelings, like what most feels like worship to us, that's not a trustworthy guide for what should be done. We shouldn't trust success, what works, what fills the room with people, what helps the church get lots of money. That's a terrible way to measure what we should do. Worship is for God's glory. It's to give him the honor that he's due so he determines how it should happen. He knows, he knows us best because he created us, and so he knows what worship is best for us as well as for his glory. So, we want to get the must from the Bible. As we go along in this series, I'm trying to mention some key resources in worship that are especially helpful. And this book by David Peterson uh, is really good. Um, I mentioned Daniel Block's book, which is also excellent. Daniel Block's book is by topic. This book by David Peterson is a biblical theology. So he starts in Genesis, and through the book, he just works all the way to Revelation. And uh, it's really, really helpful. Engaging with God, a biblical theology of, of worship. And he defines worship this way, an engagement with God on the terms that he proposes and in the way that he alone makes possible. Not an engagement with God any way we think. Uh, and Lawrence and Dever write this, left to our own devices, we will certainly dishonor God. This is because the worship of God must be a reflection of God's character, not ours. 
That character is not found by looking to ourselves, our preferences, tastes, and desires. It's found by looking to God's Word. So, we have, we have to get the musts from the Bible. Number three, stick with the musts when the whole church gathers. As we've studied gathered worship, you can see that there is an oughtness to what we do when the whole church gathers. We have to do these things together. You can see that when we talked about praying, I put pressure on our church family to not just walk out before prayer meeting because corporate prayer is a must for the gathered worship of the church. So in this, these essentials of worship, there is a, there's a mustness, an oughtness is what we, we often say. And there's a pressure upon you to be here, to be here and to participate in these things. And that's just not the same with other aspects of church life. This summer we've had Bible studies for men, men, ladies, moms, boys, girls going on um, other times during the week. And I'm thrilled about that. And you can attend those things. And they may be very helpful for you. You can go to a ladies retreat. You can send your kids to camp. You can volunteer a Bible club. You can come to park night. Many of those things are very helpful. Um, and I hope you'll take advantage of some of those things. But you don't have to. You don't have to send your kids to camp. It's not a biblical essential uh, that we're going to pressure you with. But when the whole church gathers, it's different. It's, it's the must. So as Derek Thomas writes, nothing must be required as essential to public worship except that which is commanded by the Word of God. And that is, that is good. And there's a lot of historical background to this as well, because part of the point of the regulative principle was to free people from sitting in a service where they were pressured to do something unbiblical. So, for example, praying to the saints. It's just not in the Bible. It's not biblical. And so, when people were sitting in services where they were pressured to do things like that, there was a desire to be free from that and to be only constrained by the Word of God in worship, not by something like praying to, praying to the saints. This also applies to those things that might violate someone's conscience. Romans chapter 14, For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Some Christians were free in their consciences to eat meat that had been offered to idols. But not everyone was. And so it was one thing for them to eat meat offered to idols at home. It would be another thing to require everyone to eat meat offered to idols at the Lord's Supper fellowship meal for the whole church. Now you're you're taking, you're putting this biblical ought on people. You need to do this. And yet you're putting them in a position to violate their consciences. Uh, it's not, and any more modern example I use is tricky territory. But here's one that does matter to us as a church. There was a trend for a while, and it's really not so much of a thing today, but there was a trend to, for churches to do sermon series based on hit movies. Um, so whatever was a popular movie, a church would do a six-week sermon series. It was kind of a riff off of, of that movie, and oftentimes they would show movie clips um, in the sermons uh, related to that. And there's a, a lot that's wrong with that, I hope you can see. Um, but one of the things that's wrong with that is just that Christians have differing conscience positions on what kind of movies they want to watch, and um, expose their kids to, and so forth. And so, um, to take the latest popular rated R movie and, and show you three minutes from it to help illustrate my sermon is we're not going to do it when the whole church gathers. We're going to seek to not put people in a position where we might be violating their conscience. Now, does that mean we can cater to every single conscience position of every single person? No. You, you can't you can't ultimately do that because our consciences are tricky things. They can get bound in tricky ways. And so I'm not saying that we can cater to every single person's preferences, but we seek to not pressure you to do things that the Bible doesn't say you have to do when we gather for worship. 
Any questions about that? About number three? Okay, and then number four, use biblical wisdom and principles to discern the best way to carry out the musts. So the Bible says we have to instruct, as we learned this morning. But the Bible doesn't say anything about how long a sermon should be. Or whether we should have one long sermon or several shorter scripture explanations through the service. It doesn't actually say that, anything about that. We have to pray, but who exactly should pray? How many times should we pray? When should we pray? How long should those prayers be? The Bible doesn't dictate any of those things. We have to take the Lord's Supper, but how often? And how exactly do you go about that? The Bible does not say. We have to sing, but should we sing one song or 20? Can you give me a Bible answer to that? There isn't one. There isn't one. Should we sing everything together, or should we sometime have individuals or groups sing to us? The Bible doesn't say. We need to sing psalms, but how many psalms? What portion of our singing should be from the psalms? doesn't say. What instruments best support congregational singing? You've got examples in the Old Testament, but you've got ancient instrument examples. The Bible just doesn't say nothing in the New Testament that requires certain instruments. So the New Testament gives the musts, but then there is a lot of flexibility in the carrying out of those musts. But all of that flexibility should be guided by biblical wisdom and biblical principles. It should never be the whatever principle. Pastors are the ones who are going to be especially responsible before God to consider the biblical wisdom, to consider the biblical principles, to consider their church family in our place, in our situation, and then discern what would be the wisest thing to do about those things. So, in the end, I think these words reflect well what our perspective would be on these things. Do what God clearly commands. Don't do what God clearly forbids and use scriptural wisdom for everything else. Like Colossians 3.17 says that the worship should be in all wisdom. And so that's what we're seeking to do as we talk about gathered worship and the essentials, the elements of gathered worship. Okay, there you go. Any questions about that? Who decides what we do when we worship? Okay, let's pray. Father, we want to again commit ourselves to obedience to you, to obedience to your word, to doing what you say and to worshiping in the ways that you you say are bring you honor. So guide us as a church family in both seeing clearly the essentials, but then having the biblical wisdom to know the best way to carry out those essentials for your glory. We want to do what will honor you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.